All right, my friends, welcome to the next episode here of the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A here on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel and other associated uh, feeds like on Facebook and Twitter, trying to branch out a little bit here. As always, we are taking a fundamental approach to diet and exercise to give you more power, freedom, and control over your healthy lifestyle. And this episode is sponsored by the entirety of the Red Delta Project Library, including my brand new quick read, Push, Pull, and Squat, the three most basic fundamental movements, how to program to get the biggest impact on building strength and size, whether it be calisthenics, free weights, machines, or whatever any modality you want to use. So check out the links to those. Uh, they'll be in the description down below. But today's episode is a little bit of a, a perspective shift. We're talking about four big messages that run rampant within our fitness culture, particularly on social media, that are telling you to ignore vitally important things for your health and fitness. Two of these pertain to exercise, and two of these are pertaining to diet and nutrition. And I understand where these ideas are coming from. I used to claim the same things myself for many years. So we'll be exploring a little bit on why these things come about and why so many people are saying that you should ignore these things that are so important. But more importantly, we are going to be diving into how you can put them in proper perspective so that way you don't ignore things that are vital to your success. And as always, we have folks coming on in here. Wasatch Wizard in the house. Thank you very much, my friend, and welcome. So the first thing that I often see influencers and experts telling you to ignore that you shouldn't be is the coveted, quote, mind-muscle connection. Now, this is uh, understandably something that a lot of people are critical about, largely because there's so much misunderstanding about what the mind-muscle connection actually is. And there's even a lot of research out there that is out of alignment with what it is. So a lot of times these experts will cite some of this research saying, look, they tested the mind-muscle connection. They tried to employ mind-muscle connection in these studies and it didn't really do anything. And as a result, they'll say, see, mind-muscle connection is bunk. It's quote, bro science. And it's not something we should pay too much attention to. But the fact of the matter is your mind-muscle connection is essentially the foundation that is driving the success in every aspect of your physical training. I've said it before. If your mind-muscle connection is poor, nothing you do in your training will ever have a chance of working. Every exercise will result in frustration. You won't build the strength. You won't build the muscle. You won't have the performance. Everything you do will produce poor results or lackluster results at best. But the beautiful thing about it is that if you improve that mind-muscle connection, then almost anything you do will produce pretty good results. I've seen people out there who have great mind-muscle connection in various muscles like the quads, the chest, the shoulders, and so on. And when you ask them, what do you do for that? They'll be like, nothing. Like I, I stack hay bales on the farm. I run marathons. I don't do anything for this muscle group. It just grows like a weed. And it's very strong whenever I've kind of tested it in uh, like college sports teams and stuff. It's like, gee, I wonder if you can leg extension the entire stack on this weight machine. And they're like, oh yeah, it's easy because of that mind muscle connection being so strong. So why is this off the rails quite a bit? Well, it's because one of the biggest misconceptions about mind-muscle connection is that it is all about thinking about the muscle as you're working it, thinking about your biceps when doing bicep curls. And to that end, I totally agree. It's not going to do very much because I can think about a muscle all day long and that not, nothing happens really if you think about the muscle. I can think about you know this coffee mug all day long, but tea isn't going to magically come into it or I can think about a light bulb, it's not gonna turn on no matter how much I'm thinking about it. And that's why a lot of folks don't trust mind-muscle connection is because a lot of the rhetoric about uh, the idea is that mind-muscle connection is about engaging the muscles more by thinking about them. But the fact is, mind-muscle connection is not at all about thinking about the muscle. In fact, in many ways, it has nothing to do with the muscle at all. Instead, it's all about proactively putting tension and controlling the tension in the muscle. And this is vitally important because fundamentally your muscles are driven by your nervous system. 
That's why in many textbooks, and many people refer to it as the neuromuscular system. To talk about your muscles without talking about nerves is like talking about an automobile while discrediting the engine and transmission. Because in that analogy, your body, if your body was an automobile, your muscles are nothing more than the wheels. That's all they are. They're where the proverbial rubber meets the road. But the engine and then transmission is what's driving your wheels in exactly the same way as your nervous system is driving your muscles. And yes, you can and should be trying to develop that neural drive. And that's what the mind-muscle connection really is. It's not so much about the, quote, connection. It's about developing the neural drive to make the muscles respond to a higher level of performance. That is something you can certainly improve upon. In fact, the bulk of everything you want from your training depends on that neural drive. Just as if you had a race car and you thought, I want to make my car go faster. Well, you're going to have to upgrade the engine and the transmission and all the ways you're generating and transmission power. Yes, the wheels are important. You want them balanced. You want good tires and stuff. However, you want to focus on what's driving the car, aka your muscles and your body, more than ever. So when these experts and these influencers are saying, don't worry about the mind-muscle connection, it's bunk, they're literally saying, you've got a great race car, but don't worry about the engine. It's making a weird noise and smoking, and eh, don't worry about it. The engine's not that important. The transmission gears are grinding, and eh, don't worry about it. You, go to, you only focus on the wheels, only focus on the wheels. Or even worse, just make sure you do the right exercises and the right program. That's kind of like saying your car will run fine if you just drive it on the right road. The exercise you're doing is not driving your muscles. Let me say that again to make it clear. The exercise you do is not driving your muscles. Bicep curls are not making your biceps work hard. They are the application for the generation of that tension. I'm creating tension in my biceps to do the curls. Just as you would put the force through the wheels of a car, you're driving the car on the road, but the road does not drive the car. So we can't put the cart before the horse or the horse before the cart here. We've got to make sure we're understanding what's truly responsible for making your muscles do what you want in order to train them as effectively as possible. And that is, for lack of better terminology out there, very much dependent upon the mind-muscle connection. So don't get too caught up in these ideas of, oh, as long as you have good technique, as long as you have the right program, as long as you're right, doing the right exercises, then your muscles are going to do what you want it to do. There's no guarantee at all of that. Because if your mind-muscle connection is not very good, aka your tension control is not very good, it won't matter what program you're on. It won't matter what exercises you're doing. It won't really matter if your technique is good because you have compensatory patterns all over the place. Remember years ago, I had a lot of trouble with my extension chain, particularly getting my glutes and hamstrings to engage. And at the time I was all about kettlebell swings and deadlifts and all that sort of thing. So I would have coaches watch me and be like, something is off. I'm still feeling it all in my lower back. I'm still not feeling so good about it. What is going on? And they would look at my program and they would even look at my technique and they would sit there and be like, eh, you got a little bit of this going on or that going on, but otherwise you, everything looks fine. Everything looks okay. I don't know why you're having trouble with this. Maybe you're just not built for it. Years later, though, I recognize that, yeah, because your lats and your glute activation is terrible. Of course, you're going to have a bad deadlift or really poor swings because you don't have good tension control in those supportive and driving muscles. Of course, it's not going to be good. But I had compensatory patterns going on. and I had a good program on paper. So on looking at those things, it looked fine, but that mind-muscle connection and tension control was terrible. So of course I wasn't getting very good results from it. But once I started to improve those things, then everything started to get a lot better and stronger. So tension control is of vital importance and it is very, very important. And we can always improve upon it, but we sure as hell do not want to ignore it. And as always, I'm a big fan of using overcoming isometrics to improve that tension control. And as always, I have a full playlist on overcoming isometrics and how to incorporate it into workouts. That's why my grind style calisthenics program is all about start off with overcoming isometrics to improve the tension control with every single workout. It's also a wonderful warm up, And that way you're not only making your workouts 
far more reliably effective, but it's also much more comfortable because you're able to generate tension in the muscle more readily. Your workouts feel amazing. And it's also a lot safer on your joints. All right, folks coming on in. Let me ask, answer some questions here. Matt C saying, are you a fan of fluff and puff training? <laughs> a little bit. I'm assuming I know what you're talking about with this. I can't say for sure, but um, assuming you're talking about pumping training kind of kind of things where you're trying to get a good pump in the muscles and really get things fired up and uh, really feeling the muscle. Am I correct in that? Let me know just so I know if I'm answering the right thing. Dave is coming on. It's always good to see you, David. Uh, hey, Matt, for the mind-muscle connection, how does that interplay with chain training, heavy compound lifts and movements? This is something I was wondering about. So yeah, very good. The whole chain training theory that I've come across with all my books and all my methods use chain training as a way of per, uh, bringing perspective to how the muscles work with the body. It also makes programming and being able to plan out your workouts a hell of a lot simpler and easier. So when we're using these mind-muscle connections, what we're essentially trying to do is generate tension throughout the entire chain. You have your push, pull, and squat chains, and you have your three support chains of flexion, extension, and lateral. And the objective with chain training is to get tension to flow throughout the entire chain. So if we're doing pull-ups, for example, we don't want to be like, oh, it's all in the biceps and I barely feel it in my back. Or if we're doing push-ups and it's like, it's all in my shoulders and I don't even feel my chest. That is a very big problem because it shows that there's not a whole lot of neural drive to the associated muscles. And we don't want to ignore that, which brings me right into the second thing that a lot of fitness influencers are telling you to ignore, even though it's vitally important, which is what I like to call neuromuscular feedback. Neuromuscular feedback is essentially the information coming the other way from our nervous system. So when we're talking about tension control and mind-muscle connection, we're developing the pathways to get the signal that's coming from our brain through our nervous system into the muscles. But we're also having signals going from our muscles back into our brain, and we're perceiving these signals in forms of sensations, of the muscle contracting, feeling a burn in the muscle, for example, being able to pertain to how much tension is in the muscle, the pump, all this stuff that's coming back to us. So in other words, we should feel the muscles working. And I used to say this myself again, and a lot of other experts who out there will say, don't worry about this stuff, because a lot of stuff is kind of anti-bodybuilder rhetoric out there. Like, don't worry about the pump. Don't worry about how the muscles are feeling. A lot of the bodybuilder stuff, especially in the 80s and 90s, was about squeezing the muscle, getting a good pump, feeling the muscle work, and a lot of strategies were about trying to really develop these sorts of qualities. But of course, a lot of times in the late 90s, early 2000s especially, things kind of went anti-bodybuilder for somewhat good reasons. But a lot of the stuff got kind of was a baby thrown out with the bathwater type of idea. And some people were saying outright, doesn't matter how the muscles feel. It doesn't matter how the exercise feel. Just as long as you have good technique, then you should be good. Don't worry about your feeling of it. Which I get where they're saying because... Theoretically, you should have your muscles working as they should be if your technique is good, but that does not always happen because, again, you can be just compensating in very subtle ways and uh, make the technique look good, but you're still not engaging the muscles very well. It happens all the time. So the fact of the matter is when your mind-muscle connection improves, you should have an improvement on how the muscle feels during the exercise. So if I'm improving my mind-muscle connection to my lats, for example, then yeah, when I'm doing pull-ups and bridges and other things, it should be like, whoa, holy smokes, my lats are, wow, whoa, holy, wow, that is really lit up, or wow, that really feels different. That's very, very, very important, my friends. You definitely want to feel the muscles working, especially if you're doing things to try and make it bigger and stronger. You definitely want to be paying attention to these things. It is of vital importance because if you don't feel like the muscle's working very much, chances are that neural drive to the muscle isn't really happening very well. And that doesn't mean the muscle's not doing anything. And it doesn't mean the muscle isn't going to be building because you'll hear this all the time when people are like, ah, I never feel it at all in my quads and yet my quads get big and strong. Yeah, it is possible, but not likely. It's more the exception to the rule. 
But when we ignore these things or we don't try to make these things happen, again, it feeds into, oh, I may have poor neuromuscular control, but I don't care. I'm not paying attention to it. And that can really be detrimental to your workouts because you're not getting the neural drive to the muscle. You're not able to get the muscles to work collectively together. So performance is going to suffer. And there's probably going to be a lot more stress in the joints because a lot of times stress in a joint means that uh, there's a muscle somewhere that's not doing its job. When we're doing squats or lunges and we're like, it's all in my knees, that usually tells me poor hip activation. Your quads may not be engaging enough for your hamstrings. Something somewhere is not doing its job because the stress should be in the muscle, not in the joints. Notwithstanding if you have any sort of actual joint issues, like, yeah, I just tore my ACL yesterday. And it's like, well, of course, that's going to be a bad thing. But you get what I'm saying is that we want the muscle telling us something. We want to tell the muscle what to do, and we want to be receiving feedback from the muscle saying that it's actually doing it. So you can see how both of these messages can be so destructive for the quality of your workouts because you're literally ignoring or not trying to pursue better signals to the muscles, and you're ignoring any signals coming back from the muscles. So we're ignoring those red flags. And that can be very detrimental both ways. We want to have very good signals going to the muscle, and we want to be receiving a lot of feedback from the muscle. And if we're ignoring both, good luck, my friends. <laughs> That's not a good way to build a foundation for safer and more effective, not to even to mention more enjoyable workouts. Because when we feel our muscles working more, our workouts, especially if you're kind of going along a strength bodybuilder style of things, they feel a lot more satisfying too. It feels really good. It's a lot more fun. So why not embrace those things that are going to bring you a lot more instead of ignoring them? Because there's no downside to these things. There's no downside to trying to improve the mind-muscle connection or gain more neuromuscular feedback. More of those things is only going to help you. It's that simple. Very good. Let me get to some more questions before I address the other two, which pertain to diet. S. Lee saying, hey, Matt, I get a tingling nerve feeling in my left elbow when doing uh, parallel bar dips. When I do straight bar dips, I don't get that feeling. Are straight bar dips as good as parallel dips? Yeah, they can certainly be, but I would more uh, likely encourage you to say, why is that tingling there? That tells me something is going wrong. Get a video of yourself doing the parallel bar dips from the side and the rear angle and see what's going on in that uh, perspective. Something is off, and chances are if it's off in the parallel dips, it's also going to be off with most other pushing movements. The, the horizontal bar dips, push-ups, pressing. Usually, again, when an exercise is causing a problem, it's not causing it, it's exposing the problem. And if we are ignoring that sort of thing, then that problem is going to be allowed to persist and it's probably going to get worse. So you could, for example, say, okay, no more parallel bar dips. I'm going to do horizontal bar dips. And you could be good for the next several months, but then it might start to crop up in the horizontal dips. And then you might say, okay, no more dips entirely. I'll just do push-ups, And the problem just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Figure out what's going on there. It might just be as simple as a turned wrist. You know, your one wrist is turned a little bit more and you're putting pressure on a nerve somewhere. I put money on maybe a shoulder is elevating slightly or that you don't have quite as much back activation somewhere. Something's going on. Figure that out because if you don't, it may be to your much greater detriment in the long run. David's following up with this comment the other day uh, from uh, the chain training. Hey, Matt, just to make sure I'm understanding a bit. You're not saying that I'm telling my lats, rear delts, biceps, to pull me up during the pull-up, but that I should be able to feel those during uh, <laughs> during after the pull-up set. Yeah, during for sure. So it's people overthink this a lot, you know, when it comes like, so what does this mean? How I'm training? How does this? So I'm doing my reps a different way, or I should be doing my pull-ups a certain. No, all I'm saying is you should just be feeling the muscle contract to some degree. Chain training is about using all of the muscles in a chain to some degree. You almost want to feel like you don't have individual muscles when you're doing basic compound movements. You want to feel like the entire entire chain is one cohesive muscle. It's one big chunk. Now, of course, yeah, you may feel it more in particular muscles like your deltoids or your lats or something, and that's perfectly fine if it's a little more in one area or the other. 
But ideally with chain training, we don't feel individual muscles. We just feel everything working together as a solid cohesive unit. And that's kind of your, your long-term goal and objective with that. You could train for years and never really achieve that to a large degree, but you do want to feel things working because you're using the muscles to get the exercise objective accomplished. And if you're like, nah, I don't feel it all in this muscle, chances are it's not quite doing its job and it's probably going to hold you back. Thanks for the follow-up, Dave. Very good. <clears throat> Matt C is asking, have you been to any of the national parks? I've been to a couple of them. Out here in Colorado, we've got the Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, like Estes uh, Park and stuff like that. Wonderful place. Uh, but I haven't been to really any of the big ones, like the, you know, the Yellowstones and uh, things like that. I haven't really been to those, partially because I'm not a big road trip kind of guy. A friend of mine, when we were growing up, he would always go on these big, long road trips with family, and they'd load up the pop-up camper and be gone for six weeks and stuff. And he's been to all of them, but I was never big into road trips and stuff. Plus, for the first 35 years of my life, I lived in Vermont. <laughs> Nothing in Vermont is close to you, especially the stuff that's out here out west. So if you wanted to go anywhere, you're talking about at least four or five days of travel just to get to the park. Uh, that's if you're road tripping. I know I can fly there and stuff, but for me growing up, it was never a big thing. We were always uh, road tripping to things. That's why I'm, I've been to a lot of places on the East Coast, but uh, very little experience with visiting things here on the West Coast. Esteban, good to see you again. Uh, oh, this is a good one. La what are your thoughts on ladder sets? One rep, 30 seconds, two reps, 30 seconds rest, up to max before failure then. Uh, repeat again from the beginning. Beneficial, do you think? Well, beneficial for what is always the question. Everything does something. Everything is beneficial to some degree for something. So it's always a question of for what though? Because everything works and everything has difficulty in challenging the body for adaptation, but for what purpose? But yeah, I love ladder sets. I gave a client of mine a ladder set this morning with the um, goblet squats. I just lined up a pair, set of dumbbells, it was 25, 35, 40, and so on. And it was a way for her to break into a new higher level weight. Because whenever I would give her a heavier weight right off the bat, like here, goblet squat this heavy weight, she would have an emotional resistance to it. Like, I don't want to, oh, I don't know about that. I don't think I can quite do this. But by giving her a ladder set, you know, she started off lighter than she usually did. So she's like, yeah, I got this. And the next one's like, yeah, I got this. So every time she went up a level, she's like, well, it's going to be harder, but I know I can do it. And that's how we're able to overcome that emotional resistance towards the heavier loads. Plus coming back down into the lighter ones, it gave her that satisfying kind of finisher feeling in her legs where she's got the legs burning. She likes to get her heart rate up. So it gave her simultaneously what she needed and more of what she wanted. And whenever we're programming our workouts for ourselves or for other people, it's always looking for that sweet spot between the two. Because if, especially if you're a coach, you're familiar with the idea that people just like and want certain things from their workouts, but it may not be in alignment with their goals. So a lot of coaches make the mistake of saying, ah, it doesn't matter if you want that sort of thing. It doesn't matter if you want that. What you need is this, and they'll only give them that one thing. And even though it may be what they need, they come away thinking it was a less than satisfying workout and they feel like they don't quite got as much as they want out of it. However, of course, if we just like, okay, all you want is crunches and bicep curls, great. That's what you want. That's all we're going to do. Knowing full well, yeah, but your posterior chain is terrible. We need to get some extension chain work in and we totally neglect it. So ideally, whenever we're programming our workouts, we want to have the mix of what you need and what you want, and therefore you get everything. And ladder sets can be a good way to go about doing that. It can give you a wide variety. It's fun. It's a little bit more engaging than just straight sets and being bored and counting down. It's giving you a variety of repetitions and weights. I think it's a great way to program, especially new techniques as well, and getting people outside their comfort zone. So... We covered the first two things, uh, vital important things that are for your workouts, mind-muscle connection, aka tension control, and of course the neuromuscular feedback, which is going the other way along your nervous system. Both incredibly important, very vital. Don't let anybody tell you it's not important. Now let's talk about diet. 
we're talking about nutritional things that are out there. And the first is something that really kind of irks me a little bit. And this is very prevalent, especially in fad diet culture, because a lot of fad diets are based upon a mechanistic approach where they're honing in on one particular influence or a narrow set of influences that are part of what's governing your health and fitness, whether it's uh, hormones like insulin or what's happening during intermittent fasting or the effects of various foods like processed foods or uh, animal products and stuff. Maybe it's a macronutrient thing or carbs and fat or protein or what have you. Now, the thing with a mechanistic approach is that it is technically factually correct. So whatever they're citing about insulin and ketosis and all that, it is technically true. But the problem with it is that they're saying this is going on, this is how the body reacts when you eat a high fat diet or whatever. And they're saying, great, so that's the solution. Put all your eggs in that one basket and nothing else matters. So you'll get that a lot in our dietary culture. It's all about carbs and sugar, so calories don't matter. It's all about avoiding processed foods. So again, like how much you eat doesn't matter. It's all about carbs because fat doesn't matter or what have you. It doesn't matter what the type of rhetoric they're talking about. What they're basically saying is this is the thing that matters. This other thing that we're told is supposed to matter doesn't matter. They'll cite things like, remember back in the 90s when we're all low fat? Yeah, the whole low fat thing is bunk. That means fat doesn't matter. You can eat as much as you want. It'll never do anything bad for you. Go whole ham with it. Or, you know, the old research and uh, science are in uh, their agenda of the calorie balance. But if you eat the right foods, you don't need to worry about calories and so on. This is nothing more than pure science fiction. Because when it comes to a dietary perspective, everything matters. There's not a single thing that doesn't have an influence on your health. And wait, if it has calories, it has an influence to your weight, regardless of what it is. I don't care if it's the most natural, organic, healthiest salmon in the world. If it has a caloric content, it has some degree of an influence on your weight, no matter what. So when we're looking at these sorts of things, one of the reasons we want to avoid this type of rhetoric is because when we put all our eggs in that one proverbial basket, you're taking your attention off of other things that are still very much important. However, we need to keep in mind that while everything does matter, nothing matters entirely. No one thing has full control over your particular result. So while you can give me everything in the world about sugar and carbohydrates and stuff, sugar and carbohydrates does not solely control your weight or how much body fat you have. It is an influence. It is part of the puzzle. But I don't care how clean your diet is, it's not the entire picture. And so not only are you potentially ignoring something that's still very important, but it's also severely limiting your potential. Because no matter how much you put into maximizing and optimizing and perfecting sugar or carbs or processed foods or whole foods or whatever that thing is, it's always going to have a very limited impact. No matter how perfect that low carb diet is, no matter how well you stay in ketosis, you're always very limited because the other influences are still there. Those other influences are still playing their role. And when these influencers are saying, oh, don't worry about it, they don't play a role, that's simply not true. So you're ignoring things that are important. That's why a fundamental approach to diet and exercise always uses a multi-influential approach to these things. It's never about one thing. And the way that we can approach that is if we're looking at particularly like say weight loss, what are you going to do to lose weight? Okay, I'm on the keto diet. Okay, good. Now, I don't care how great that diet is. I don't care how strictly you can stick to it. It's always going to have a limited influence. It could be very good for the first several weeks or even several months, but I guarantee you it's not going to be enough. It's going to be limited and you're only going to go so far and then nothing else because your body's going to regain homeostasis. And then fundamentally, of course, what the diet did was it didn't make you lose weight. It taught you how to prevent weight loss on the new diet, because that's what all diet and exercise habits do, is they cause adaptation in the body for the sake of regaining homeostasis. And when you regain homeostasis, you stop 
changing. You stop getting healthier. You stop losing weight. You stop getting stronger. You stop getting faster. Of course, in exercise, we know this. So we're like, yeah, I know. That's why you add more weight to the bar. <laughs> That's why you do progressive exercises. That's why you have progression. So you gain homeostasis and you're like, great. Now we can get even stronger. Because I know it sounds a little funky, but you can't get better until you hit a plateau. <laughs> it's just like climbing up Everest. You can't reach El Everest unless you stop at base camp and acclimate to the altitude. If you tried to climb Everest in one shot, it wouldn't be too pretty. It's the exact same thing in all things health and fitness. You bring yourself up to a level, you potentially hit a plateau or you are forced to hit a plateau for a while, and then you can keep moving forward. But when you have a very limited approach, particularly with diet, it's like, this is my plan. And once I've made the plan work perfectly, then I've got nowhere else to go. Don't be surprised you have very limited results. And now you're stuck working as hard as possible just to maintain where you're at. That's not a very good place to be, is it, ladies and gentlemen? But when we have a multi-influential approach, what that means is you're taking many things into account. You're taking fat and protein and carbs and calories and physical activity and cardio and strength and sleep and water and, 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 and you're not having to bring any of these to an extreme level, but you're making a lot of things happen in moderation, which is a lot easier to maintain, but collectively it makes a much bigger impact. And not only does that make it easier to keep moving forward and easier to maintain, but it's also a heck of a lot easier on mind, body, and lifestyle. So don't get stuck into thinking, this is the thing that matters most and all the other stuff doesn't matter. Anytime an influencer is telling you that some aspect of diet does not matter, one, they're just flat out wrong. And two, recognize they are going to try, going to limit you. Not on purpose. I'm not saying they're trying to trick you or anything. They've been deceived themselves. I'm not saying it's an evil thing. It's just that this type of rhetoric has fooled even the smartest individuals. It's fooled me for many years as well. That's why I'm telling you this stuff right now in today's podcast, because I don't want you to get stuck in these rhetoric cycles where you just keep going around and around and not getting anywhere. More questions here. Joseph Bello, Matt says, I made my workout shorter. I feel my muscle more engaged. Interesting. I'm thinking setting up a second workout. So I have a B workout. Not sure what exercise to pick for it uh, and have it short. This is a very, very good question. By all means, add exercise if you feel like it. If you have the time and the energy and the resources, go for it. Wonderful. But always remember that the purpose of our exercise is to create a stimulus. You don't get results by hard work. You don't get results by just expending time and energy. If that was the case, we'd all be in shape because everybody does that. It's like being proud of a participation trophy. It's, yeah, great. You put in effort, la-di-da, but that in no way in shape and form entitles you or makes you deserving of results. You get the results by creating the stimulus. So we must make sure that with that extra exercise that you're doing, that you can create an effective stimulus. Now, if you are doing something that's more or less the same of what you've already done, it may not be all that worthwhile. So if you're like, I did a bunch of push-ups in the morning and in the afternoon, I did a bunch of push-ups again, same thing. I would question whether or not that's really worth it because you're not really doing anything above and beyond what you already did. Or you could be saying, all right, I did half of my workout like let's say push chain in the morning and pull chain later on. Okay, great. I did a whole video on Red Delta Project YouTube channel the, earlier this week addressing this very question. That can be good depending on what you prefer and what your circumstances are. But what I always recommend whenever someone is looking to add exercise or workouts to things is make things different enough so you can be sure that you're creating an additional or more beneficial stimulus. So let me give you an example. A common thing that I come across a lot is when people are saying, okay, I do pull-ups in the morning and I do like neutral grip pull-ups. And then later in the day, I do wider overhand pull-ups and then close grip pull-ups. And then, and then I'll do banded pull-ups and then I'll do weighted pull-ups and all these different things. But fundamentally, you're not really changing a whole heck of a lot. You're still hitting like three sets of eight to 12 repetitions and so on. 
So when you do a different exercise, still, yeah, get the pull chain, the basic fundamental movement pattern. Or if you're doing cardio or something, you're still getting your heart rate up, but make it different enough so you're exposing the body to new stimuli. So that way you're getting more for your time and effort. So let's say you do pull-ups in the morning, you're doing weighted pull-ups, maybe three to five repetitions or a five by five, let's say. You get a five by five, really hard, really heavy, awesome, great, wonderful. And then later on in the day, you're like, I wanna still hit my back a little bit. Good, let's do some rows. Let's do single arm rows instead and go higher repetition, let's say like 10 to 15 reps. So now you're changing up what your muscles are doing and what your body's doing enough that you can be sure that you're still getting additional benefit from the extra time and energy you're investing into it. But if you just did kind of the same thing again, it'd be questionable on whether or not you're really getting more out of it. And even if you are getting more out of it, is it worth the extra time and effort? So go after something different. Or you could just say, great, I did you know, my run in the morning and now I'm gonna go and do a set of lunges. Good, yes. You want your body to be doing things different if you add on things. And that way you can be more sure that you're getting additional benefit rather than just putting in more effort for the same thing. Dan Osek, hey Matt. Uh, regarding co cortical inhibition with isometrics, yes, this is basically where your nervous system is inhibiting your ability to contract your muscles very hard because it knows it can't really do anything uh, when it's applying force against an immovable object. Anyway, a certain exercise with the iso chain does not allow for the spring to move because of the light load. Very good observation. Does it matter that much or am I overthinking? No, you're not overthinking at all. In fact, you're extremely smart to be asking this question because that spring grab it here. This spring for the ISO chain is really tough and heavy duty. I mean, I can't pull it apart at all. So it does certainly seem like there's nothing going on here. Like there's no force. So I'm not able to overcome that inhibition. And you're right. For some of the exercises, it may not be doing all that much. Like if you're doing front raises with you know, the ISO chain, because that's inherently just a weak exercise. You're never gonna have a lot of force going into that, but they needed to use a heavy enough chain. So you had to overcome some cortical inhibition for things like deadlifts and squats and stuff. So with those types of exercises, I would certainly argue that it probably doesn't matter very much because that cortical inhibition it's not going to be there very much if you're just doing like front raises and even bicep curls because you're just not putting that much force into the exercise. So it probably doesn't matter very much. But that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited about the Isomax that Dragon Door is coming out with. I think it's getting released next month, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I've pre-ordered it and I'm very excited about it because it uses a strap instead of a chain and a spring. And the beautiful thing about those nylon straps, especially design they have with the daisy chain, is that it's more like a bit of a rubber band where it will initially start to stretch even under light loads. Plus it's a lot lighter and it's a lot more portable. I think it's a far better design. And that's why I also have a strap on my actual ISO chain. I replaced the chain with a basic strap. I have a video on the RDP YouTube channel that details how I did it. Very quick and easy. I think it's a better design. So A, don't worry too much about it if you don't feel the spring moving very much. It's probably for exercises that don't really need to overcome it all that much. And two, if you're really curious about it, put on a nylon strap instead of the chain and you'll have the benefits of the ISO Max right away. And it'll probably cost you about 10, 15 bucks for that modification. So very good uh, observation. <clears throat> All right, Spicy J with the jacked up Garfield. It's good to see you, my friend. Thank you for the email earlier this week as well. Saying, hey Matt, been doing my pushups with my elbows closed and brushing against my torso. Feel it more on my chest, but a problem. Can't feel my lats anymore. <laughs> Gonna be my shoulders extending. Uh, try a lot. <clears throat> Very good observation there, Spicy J. So I would look at the possibility that you don't have quite as much scapular depression, particularly at the bottom. So a lot of times when people have things tucked in and they come forward, they do have a little bit of scapular elevation and protraction at the bottom of these pushups. And even just a little tiny bit may inhibit some of that tension in your lats. But it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, there isn't any. It's just you're not going to that level where they're really feeling the contraction at all. So try this on for size though. 
make sure you're doing your push-ups from the bottom position first. I'm a big fan of starting on the floor. So that way you can really, you know, get your shoulders back, get them depressed and everything. And then when you drive up, you keep them depressed until the very uh, end of it. You're going to get it more in your chest and you will have it more in your lats. But if you don't feel like it's like super hard in the lats, that could also just simply mean that your lats are really flipping strong. So some of that neuromuscular feedback that I was talking about earlier is also relative to some degree to the degree of the strength in the muscle to begin with. Now, when we're doing our push-ups and our dips, we do want a lot of supportive tension in the lats to support our shoulder blades and be able to stabilize the scapula and the shoulders and stuff. But if your lats are just really, really strong, the amount of necessary tension in them for that stability may just simply be relatively low compared to how strong you are, and you may not feel it that much. Plus, you've got that feeling in your chest now, and your chest is going, hey, I'm screaming bloody murder here. I'm really working. And your lats are working, but it's so much quieter than your chest relatively that you're just simply not hearing them, so to speak. But if you had that level of tension in your lats, just sitting in a chair, you'd probably feel it. So that could be going on. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Just make sure those shoulders are being depressed at the bottom of the push-up. And if that's the case, then you're probably fine and good. Dave following up here. Hey Matt, what do you recommend for a platform for ISO trainers? Two by four, good enough for deadlifts. Eh, you want something bigger than that. You want something that you can get a really good flat, solid platform where your entire foot is really, really well rooted down. I and mean, maybe you can have multiple two by fours that can work very well, but it, it shouldn't be small and narrow enough that you feel like you're kind of balancing on it. You want it fairly big. I think the platform for the ISO chain and the new ISO max is about um, roughly two feet by one foot. doesn't need to be terribly big, uh, roughly the size of a couple pizza boxes stuck together, uh, but uh, it shouldn't necessarily be big, but you do want to make sure that you can also move your feet relative to the anchor point of the chain. Because if you look at the platform of the ISO chain, what they did was they took the anchor point and they moved it off center. So that way, some exercises, you're going to benefit from having the chain anchored squarely between your toes or between your feet, like on your forefoot. Sometimes you're going to want the chain anchored more towards the ball of the foot. I find that's handy for things like bicep curls. And sometimes you're going to want the chain anchored a little bit more back, kind of like between your heels. So if you have that anchor point right in the middle, which is fine, but the platform's not big enough, you may find that if you put your feet relative to the anchor point where you want it to be, you may be a little heavy to the front or the back of the platform. And you may find that it's kind of pulling you backwards or forwards or tipping you or likely to apply force in that way. So you want to make sure the platform is big enough so that if you move slightly forward or backward from that anchor point, that you still feel very solid and stable on that platform. That's the only thing I would really consider. And also, I mean, the, the ISO chain platform is, is fairly wide, but sometimes it's really fun to have nice wide stances like lunges and sumo deadlifts and just having a wide stance for the sake of being able to adjust your body position relative to the chain. So if I'm doing an overhead press and my feet are shoulder width apart, and I'm like, oh, that's, that's still, I want it a little higher. Instead of adjusting the chain or the strap that you're using, you can just use a wider stance and you'll drop down a couple inches. But if your platform is too small, then you're not going to be able to go with that wider stance. So when in doubt, go with a little bit of a bigger platform than you think you need. And that way, you're not going to be limited with a lot of positioning options when it comes to your isometrics. All right. So let's go on the fourth thing, the final thing that uh, fitness influencers often tell you to ignore, even though it's vitally important. And this is, again, with dietary cues, but it's a little bit more physiological because we were talking about feedback from our muscles earlier. Now we're talking about feedback from our body in general about our dietary practices. What I'm talking about is hunger, cravings, fluctuations in energy level, and so on. There's a lot of stuff in our fitness culture that is encouraging you to ignore the feedback your body is giving you relative to your changes in your dietary habits. It's like, oh, this diet is great, or this type of eating is great, but man, my energy level is... Now, this happened a lot when low carb started to really get popular. Of course, I run into a lot of uh, cycle circles or circles of endurance athletes. So I would have clients coming in 
know, like how are things going? How's the new diet going? They're like, great. It's awesome. It's wonderful. But man, I go out for a run and in 15 minutes, I am dragging. My legs are just heavy and I'm not recovering very well. And I'm just hungry more often. I don't know what's going on. And inevitably I'm like, yeah, you're too low in your carbohydrate intake. Put some rice with dinner tonight. But they would fall into the rhetoric of, no, really, it's all about carbohydrate. That's the only thing that matters. And so, therefore, I'm putting all my eggs in that one basket. We always listen to the body. Now, yes, of course, there's going to be times when you're going to be hungry and having cravings and stuff. And you may need to fight that, particularly if you're trying to go with a recomposition objective for the sake of just looking good on stage. I've known bodybuilders and figure competitors throughout the years, and they're like, yeah, I feel like absolute crap <laughs> the day of competition because I've basically been starving myself for the past couple of months. I don't feel very good. And that's an accepted thing. That's the cost of being able to get into that type of condition. But they'll be the first to tell you, this is not healthy. This is not something you should be doing on a regular basis. As soon as that contest is done, that diet is done. So they're not saying that's how we should be eating. What I'm talking about is the big chronic dietary habits we have for long-term health and well-being in particular. Yeah, when you're losing weight, sure, there's going to be times you're going to be hungry or you may be craving something here and there. But when we're talking about long-term things, especially when it comes to health, we don't want to have these things. Remember, the eat to satisfy approach for a healthy diet here at Red Delta Project is all about removing stress from the body, not causing it. A healthy diet should not result in chronic hunger and cravings and just feelings of lethargy and being off. That's usually a sign that your diet is actually inadequate, that it's not a very good diet. And these individuals who are like, no, nope, you've got to ignore these things. You've got to fight these things. This is just the cost that you have to pay in order to live longer and be healthy and stuff. That's simply not true because these are signs of a woefully inadequate diet or unmet appetites. A good, healthy diet plan should not have you fighting these things on a regular basis. It's that simple. And there can be a lot of things we can go into the weeds with this sort of thing. Emotional needs met by food, uh, eating history, reasons why we actually have cravings in the first place. If you have chronic cravings for a particular type of food because it helps you de-stress, yeah, that's not going to be met by just nutritional interventions. There, there's some psychology and emotional uh, exploring that needs to be done. But the bottom line is that when we have these common messages that are like, ignore the hunger, ignore your body, basically treating it like it's some alienated stranger that's trying to constantly screw you over, this is not rhetoric or the foundation for a truly healthy diet, my friends. This is basically more just abusive type ways of using food and diet. All right. Couple more questions here before we sign on off. Derek Peterson, good to see you, my friend. New to the channel, welcome. Uh, new to your books, thank you very much. Love micro stuff. Changed my whole paradigm altogether, brother. What with that? What exactly is the Isomax or Iso Trainer? Oh, very good. So I, these are isometric pieces of equipment. So Iso Trainer. This is the Iso Trainer. When people are getting into isometric equipment, this is where I usually steer people first. It's just basically a couple of handles on a strap. And this allows you to practice overcoming isometrics very conveniently and efficiently. I think this is like a $35 device. You can get it world fit. I have links on the channel. I've got reviews on this stuff. If you check out the overcoming isometrics playlist on my channel, you'll find all the information you need there. But uh, overcoming isometrics, truly wonderful discipline, great supplement for any other type of dynamic strength training. And these are just tools that are used for that type of discipline. Quite the rabbit hole to fall down and into. But uh, email me at reddeltaprojectgmail.com if you have further questions on that. Simon Cho saying, hey, Matt, just saying hi. Hello, Simon. Good to talk to you. Great to catch a live before I head off for a run. Have fun on your run. Uh, training every day over the past over the last few weeks, trying to find that push my body level at present. Absolutely. Running can be a good way to do that. Try and find a good hill. <laughs> Try and find something that gets you going up upwards against gravity. That's a very good way to go about it. Uh, I was talking about uh, hiking and going up mountains uh, as opposed to rucking uh, the past couple of episodes, getting a lot of questions on rucking. And I've got a special 
edition of the RDP podcast that's going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks because my bet my buddy Dan Vinson of monkey.co he lives right up here in Boulder he's coming out with a rucking backpack that he's developed and he's always de designing new things and he's all about rucking so I'm really excited to meet with him because I've got my own thoughts and opinions on rucking and I'm not honestly too excited about it I think it's better to just go uphill but I'm excited to talk with my friend and get his thoughts and opinion because I guarantee you there's things I haven't thought about or maybe I just need to learn more to get a better and more clear perspective on it. So keep an eye out for that on the RDP YouTube channel and the RDP podcast. Make sure you're subscribed. That will be coming out probably in the next several weeks. And Derek says, saying, uh, love listening to the body uh, adage as well. Have fun on your run. Very good. I love how you guys are talking to each other. This is fantastic community we have here. We all support each other. Uh, Mark, hello, mackerel. <laughs> I had mackerel last night. Went out for a sushi. One of my favorite fishes. Hey, Matt, do you have any tips for not getting cramps in the traps during overhead presses? Thank you. Mm. It's very good that you're feeling your traps during the overhead presses because that's one of the little things that a lot of folks don't understand is that it's not just shrugs, but overhead presses use the traps to a very high degree in order to stabilize your shoulders. And that's why, like in Paul Wade's book, CMAS, he talks about how handstand push-ups or handstand reverse shrugs can be a very potent way to build up the traps. So good, they're engaging. But what you're experiencing are muscles that are not used to engaging to that degree for that long. Oftentimes, cramping is the result of our neuromuscular system, because again, the nervous system is driving the muscle. But if it's experiencing a level of intensity or degree that we're not used to, it kind of just gets a little jumbled and it's like, I don't know what I'm doing, just everything on. And that's when we cramp. So there's a couple of things you can do. One is just simply go with a lighter load for the time being, because you're basically overloading your muscles to the point where your nervous system doesn't really know how to regulate that neural drive just yet. So just exposing it to a little bit lighter weight and pushing it should be helpful because eventually this stuff just goes away. The other thing you can do is practice those scapular shrugs, either holding the barbell or a weight overhead and doing a scapular shrug or handstand work and just practicing it a little bit. Again, you're getting the nervous system used to that level of intensity or that type of action. And it's just through exposure and being used to it that your nervous system is going to help to self-regulate. And then you'll be able to work your muscles a heck of a lot harder without needing to cramp. So exposure therapy, in other words, lighter weight or just practicing it. Uh, with just the scapular motion should be able to help you uh, practice maybe that stuff with a bit of a warm-up. Jim Gorman, Matt, love the channel. Thank you very much. Really appreciate how you teach us how to progress, regress, and add variation to our workouts. Thank you. I feel that youth athletes could greatly benefit from your advice. And I'll tell you, my friend, that a big like internal motivation for everything that I do is I always think of not so much like the adults or the people who are trying to get in shape. But I always think of where I was when I was when I was younger, when I was 16, 17 years old, and I didn't know of any idea of what I was doing. And I was always frustrated. But my main rhetoric was to just basically beat the snot out of myself with exercise. And I took diet and exercise to abusive levels. And all those years of frustration and pain and anxiety and basically you know, if I could go back in time and teach myself this sort of stuff from, you know, what I know now, man, my life would have been so much easier. Because in all honesty, when I was growing up, I didn't deal with a lot of the challenges that people usually face. Like I didn't abuse, I didn't drink when I was in college. I was, seriously, I think four drinks my entire college career. I didn't do drugs. I had a great stable home life. I had great friends. Like everything about my life on paper was really good growing up, still is very good. I'm an extremely blessed individual. But for some reason, I had to screw it up for myself and basically make my life a living hell day after day through abusive diet and exercise habits, disordered eating habits, obsessive compulsive habits, and so on. And looking back, I realized it was all for naught. I didn't need to expose myself to any of that. And I would have changed everything 100 different ways based on what I know now. Because now I'm twice as fit and I put in half the effort and I don't worry about what I eat. I don't worry about getting in a workout. I don't worry about all that stuff anymore. So individuals who 
tell me these sorts of things. That's what my motivation is, is somewhere out there, there's a 15 year old kid who's in the same boat that I used to be in, who's struggling and is, has anxiety because they ate a piece of chocolate cake or is worried about how they can work out on vacation or all these sorts of things. And I want to take off that stress off of that one person. And as long as that one person is watching my stuff, then everything I do is entirely worthwhile. Simon is, asked, is chiming in on rucking, on that, uh, that be good. Rucking is good. Retired Army, Navy myself. Very good. Yeah, because this is the thing. A lot of people are like, I knew I was rucking before rucking was a thing. <laughs> it's just hiking with a backpack on. I had a 40-pound pack on when I hiked the AT trail. Not that I did, but other people are saying this. They're like, this is new, and that's usually how these fitness things come about, is just taking something that people have always been doing and making a thing with a new brand name and a label on it. Right. But anyway, retired Army Navy myself. Congratulations. Thank you for your service and had many of us uh, into the rucking and also running long distance or rucking. Yeah, so much to do. Very good. I love how you guys are chiming in with all of your perspectives, because all I can give you is my perspective. And as much as I try to make that as good and beneficial, recognize it is always going to be limited. So. Case in point with rucking, you know, I've got limited experience with that. I've got a ton of hiking experience, but yeah, army, Navy, you know, military, like you've got way more experience than I do. So you're more of a valid coach on that than I certainly am because I never went into the military. I'm sure if I was hiking with a 40 pound pack on and going for long runs, I may have some different insights on that just from experience. Gagora is saying, can intense isometric pushing exercises like wall pushing, where I have forearms flexed, cause vein nerve muscle tendon pinching in the forearms after a couple of days and also last for some days. Not necessarily, because fundamentally the force going through your body is no different than if you're doing things dynamically. However, some folks do experience some high levels of intensity beyond what they're used to when they do overcoming isometrics. And that can be an overload to certain tissues initially when they start off. Because if you think about it, anytime we're doing movements dynamically, we have to use less than a maximum amount of tension and force in our muscles. Because the only way you can maximize that is isometrics. Anytime you're moving to any degree, you take that force and you have to decrease it to some degree. Dynamic exercise is always going to involve less tension in the muscles than isometric, just simply due to the physics of the human body. So a lot of times when people start doing isometrics and they're like, go, and they're applying all that force, one, they're getting a lot more force going through those tissues and everything than they're used to. And two, that force is there for an exceedingly relative long period of time. So let's say you've got a super heavy bench press, for example, and you try for that one rep max. Well, again, even if it's one rep max and it's everything you've got, you're still moving, so it's less tension than if you would potentially have with an isometric. Maybe not much less, but it is. it has to be less if you're going to be moving. And during that one rep, you're doing it for maybe a few seconds. And even then, you're experiencing the maximum amount of resistance at a certain point in the rep, so it's even shorter than that. But when we have an isometric and we're like, I'm going to do this for 15 seconds, well, that's more force and a hell of a lot more time. One of the reasons I love overcoming isometrics is that it's just simply the easiest way to work the mother living hell out of the muscles. You've got only two things you can work with with your muscles. You've got how much tension is in the muscle and how much time it's there for. And it's impossible to have both with dynamic exercise. More tension, less time. More time, less tension. You have to obey that dichotomy. But with overcoming isometrics, you can have both and drive both of them basically to your absolute limit. So the bottom line is that can be very shocking to the body. And there may be nerves, tissues, things in the body that just, they're not quite ready for that just yet. So if you're experiencing things that are just not quite too happy with it right now, decrease the time and intensity just a little bit. Let the body get more acclimated to the exercise for a couple of weeks, because it's gonna acclimate very quickly. Your body adapts very fast to overcoming isometrics, which is one of the reasons why it's great. It works real well, real fast. So be patient with it a little bit, but don't be afraid to back off a little bit. I think one of the big mistakes a lot of people make with overcoming isometrics is they only go for maximum level focus and intensity all the time. And it's not necessary. 
you can go for like 80% and still get a lot out of it. It doesn't have to be all you've got all the time. Back off just a little bit, let those other uh, tissues and things build back up. And that way you can have um, the best of both worlds and you're less susceptible to injury. Overcoming isometrics is extremely safe, but like any other form of training, it's not foolproof. <laughs> it's not like it's impossible to injure yourself. You certainly can. Magnus is saying, hey, Matt, any tips for making shrimp squats and pistol squats harder? P.S. I was rocking earlier today while walking home from the grocery store. <laughs> Fantastic, particularly if you're carrying gallons of milk, my friend. Very good. Uh, so yeah, a couple of different things you can do. One of the simplest that you can practice is simply taking whatever weight is in front of you and bringing it in closer. This is why with pistol squats, I'm like, bring your arms in. If you're gonna do weighted pistol squats, don't do it with a weight way out here, bring it in closer to your torso. Years ago, I was humbled because I was uh, trying to do weighted pistol squats in my basement. And I was looking for just, I didn't have weights. So I was like, uh, something heavy. What do I have around? I found some chain. So I was like, okay, chain. And I put it around my torso, like wearing it like a vest. It's like, okay, pistol squat, here we go. And I could not do it for the life of me because that weight was closer to my torso. It wasn't way out here. So bringing things in, uh, shrimp squats in particular, you can go with a bigger range of motion. So do it on an elevated surface. So you're getting your hips closer to your heel and you can drop below the floor. That's a good way to go about it. You can always just add weight in general to that sort of thing. So pay attention also to the lean of your body. With, with shrimp squats, there's a tendency to really lean. And you got the arm out and again, bring it back. If you can get a little bit more upright and bring yourself back, that's good. Uh, you'll see some of my videos where I'm doing weighted shrimp squats or hover lunges, which is kind of the same thing, or weighted sissy squats. I'm holding a dumbbell or something here, very close to my torso. One, that makes sure that it's in a consistent place. I'm not rocking and moving all over the place. But two, it makes it harder. So bring weight closer to your center rather than having it stretch out in front, increasing the range of motion. Those are the two things that I would recommend to add resistance to it. Thank you very much. All right. Simon's coming in with lots of great advice. Pay attention to this, my friends. We are all here to help each other get stronger. Mr. Banana is saying, hello, Matt. Are there tips for mixing running with working out six times a week? Should I lower the intensity and number of days I work out or leave it unchanged? This is very good because it's a topic of a video I'm going to make this week about combining cardio and strength training together so that way they're not detrimental to each other. And there's so many ways you can manage this sort of thing. But here's the basic premise is you want to make sure that you're not putting in so much time and intensity in either that they're compromising the time and energy you have for the other. And that can depend on a lot of things. It can depend on how long you're running or working out for, how hard you're running and working out for, how uh, good your conditioning level is. You'll hear some people like, I run five miles a day and I can still squat like a power lifter. But other people are like, dude, if I run once on the weekend, my legs are shot for five days straight. So you got to kind of listen to your body with this one. Again, listen to your body. Don't ignore it. Pay attention to how you're running is influencing your strength workouts and vice versa. Now, it could very well may be that your uh, uh, priorities lie in one or the other. You know, in my book on uh, bodyweight training for cycling, I talk about how you should spend most of your time and energy cycling. And the strength training is just supplemental. So you could just be someone who says, I want to focus on being able to be the best runner I can, in which case, put most of your time and energy into your running training, because that's what's most effective, and use your strength training as a supplement. Don't worry too much about that. But on the other hand, your primary focus may be building up big strength and muscle, in which case, make sure you're not running so much that you're coming to your strength workouts kind of wiped, and you can't really push yourself. Try this for an uh, in exercise is only run once or twice during the week and do shorter, less intense runs and see what that does to your strength training. If you're going into your strength workouts with less running and you're like, yeah, it feels about the same, good. That means your running is not really compromising it. But if you cut back on your running a little bit and you find that your workouts are now just through the roof and you're going to tear your muscles to shreds and you feel amazing, it tells you your running is kind of compromising your strength workouts a little bit. 
It's going to take a little trial and error, but the bottom line is do as much as you like of either. Just be aware if one is taking time and energy away from the other. Something to think about there and food for thought. Okay, let's see if there's something else that I can address real quick before I take off. Yeah, got that one. And again, if you've got a question that I haven't answered, you really want me to address it, just send me an email, reddeltaproject at gmail.com, because I try to get to all of these, or DM me on Instagram, Red Delta Project, and uh, that way I can make sure I address these things, because these uh, are all going up on a feed, and I may miss someone sooner or later. But uh, anyway, the biggest focus that I want you to really take away from today's episode, though, folks, is that... Everything matters to some degree, but the most important thing is to recognize that which matters most to you because we're not all the same and we are always changing our priorities and our goals and how things are moving around. And there's a lot of good advice out there on the internet and social media and even influencers, but always remember that they don't know you and they don't know the degree of which their advice is going to help them. So that's why you want to take these things into a personal account. The advice is a terrible place for answers and solutions. It's a great place for ideas. So if you run across my stuff or some other influencer out there saying, do this or pay attention to that, and it's kind of resonating with you, give it a try. See what's going on and go off of your experience. But don't let anybody ever tell you that something isn't important and doesn't matter. Because I guarantee you that everything matters and has influence to some degree, but it's up to you to figure out how much of an influence it is to you and how much you should be paying attention to it. It's like overcoming isometrics. I just went off on a tangent about how I love it. It's wonderful. It's great. It's awesome. But you could give it a try and be like, yeah, it didn't really do anything for me. I didn't really like it. You listen to you, not to me. You go things uh, based off of your experience because your experience is honest and true and factual. And I'm just here to give you some ideas. What you do with those ideas is where you are going to go. So thanks very much, everybody. Love everybody coming on in. Don't forget that these are going to be available on the audio, on the podcast directory of your choice. Check out a lot of the videos and stuff at Red Delta Project's YouTube channel that I've referenced here. And of course, all of my books on uh, the Amazon page, including my quick reads like Push, Pull, Squat that are available now. And I will talk to you folks next week. Till then, be fit and live free.